Good morning. Know how the tournament went. Yeah. Yours was fractionally better than mine. What? Yours? Yours was fractionally better was than it? mine. Well, I could your tournament. But I had the random fever. Uh huh. That's a treatment. Yeah, mine's got random thing as well. Thank <laughs> you. 
Presenting a classifier, and so the idea here is that we're representing a decision-making process by a tree, um, and it's a very simple and intuitive way of understanding that we break down a decision into a, a sequence of questions that has a small number of answers. And each of those answers corresponds to a branch in the tree, and branch that you follow, then takes you to another question, and so on, follow these branches through the questions and the particular answers you get, until you get down to a leaf of the tree, which is a class label, which tells you the answer to your classification task, right, you're trying to work out what class an object belongs to. Um, and so what we're going to look at is, in, in detail, is, is how this works, how this decision process um, works and how you can learn such a tree uh, because actually classifying an object with such a tree is very simple to do, right? So we had this example last time which we looked at where we said you know, this, we could gather some data by analysing what students do whether they attend lectures or not based on the weather and that we hypothesise that there's some relationship between the two Right? There may be, there may not be, uh, but we can hypothesise that and learn a tree. And his, this is kind of the result of such a process. You come up with such a tree which says that the outlook is sunny, then, so this is the first question, what, what is the outlook? And there's three possible answers, it can be sunny, overcast or rainy. And then based on the answer, if the answer is sunny, then you ask, is it humid or not? And if it is humid, then you don't have much physics. Humidity, then you do, and so on. Right? If it's overcast, you attend lectures. That's a leaf. Right? There's no more questions. You only ask one question in that case. In this case, if it's the outlook is rain, if it's also windy, then it's not attend lectures. But if it's not, then we do. Right? That's the. According to this tree, the algorithm which people use to decide whether or not to come, um, and then the classification task is very simple because given information about what is the outlook, what is the, whether it's human or not and so on, it's very easy to, to follow the questions and come up with a, a result. Um, what we need to understand with such a representation is it should be intuitive and easy to understand, but I think what's a bit less intuitive is how we then perform learning using such a, um, a representation or in order to achieve such a representation. And the way we have to think of it is that this um, tree is, or any classifier, is partitioning uh, the 
attribute space. All right, so each question, if you think about all the possible data points you could have, so each data point is either a particular student or a particular day of the week or whatever. Um, so it's a particular situation in which you know what the weather was like and you know whether the student attended or not uh, in order to do learning. Um, and so what's happening when you have a tree, such as this one, we go back to it, uh, that when you ask this question, you're sorting all of the examples you have, all the training examples, into those for which the outlook field or parameter, whatever you want to call it, the outlook equals sunny would be here, all of the ones where it is overcast are here, all of the ones where it's rainy would be here. So we're taking a set of examples and splitting them into three subsets based on this variable or feature called outlook. Right, and then we do the same thing recursively, right? We keep splitting, we split the examples for which the outlook is sunny into two subsets, those for which the outlook is sunny and its high humidity, and those for which the outlook is sunny and its normal humidity. Right, so now we've got subsets down here. The subset here we don't split any further. And this subset where the outlook is rainy, we split into two subsets based on the attribute windy. So we end up with these five different subsets of examples. And the aim by doing these splits is to end up with when we're training the system, right, is to end up with examples where they all have the same class label. Right? And in this case, we've got two classes. Yes, I attend lecture, the lecture, or no, I don't attend the lecture. So, and the, so the yes cases are now purely in these three subsets, and the no cases are purely in these two subsets. And there's no overlap. Right? If there was some overlap, if one of these subsets had a mixture of yeses and noes, then we'd ask another question to split it again. We keep splitting it until we have subsets where each subset is pure, has only one class label. But that's the aim of, and that's the way we have to think about. So it's not just to classify a single example where you're just following a path through the tree, but if you're thinking of classifying all possible examples, right, your whole space, then this is splitting the space into a partition. Right, because each of these subsets, if we take them all, the union of them all, we get back the original set. And if we take the intersection of any pair of subsets, it's always empty. Because there's no example which can be at two different places in the tree. Right, because of the way the questions were asked. Right? They must have different answers to end up in different places in the tree. OK, so we're going to look at the algorithm, well I introduced it last time, but I thought I'd go over it again because we didn't have a lot of time to really go into detail. So the, the big problem with taking a data set and trying to work out what is the correct decision tree or what's the best decision tree, the um, big problem is knowing you know, what question do I ask and particularly what order do I ask the questions in? Is there a kind of an optimal ordering of questions that I can ask that minimizes the number of questions I need to ask and uh, therefore simplifies creates a smaller tree. But now eventually you could just test every single attribute. Right? If you have a hundred different features you could just say you know, split on each of them going from attribute one to attribute hundred. You would have a tree that classifies your training set. Um, but generally what we want is we want to have a simple tree as small as possible and the reason is of course that we don't want to overfit. We don't want to just model the training data. We want it to generalize to other data we haven't seen. And for that to work, generally the simplest tree is generally the best. Okay, so that's our goal. Um, come up with a general classifier but also one which is fast to apply. Um, so generally with machine learning we allow the training to be reasonably slow as long as the classification is fast. So, so when we're training it, we're putting all the, the, the data which we, we know what the class label is, we put that in and it learns the representation, it learns the tree. That can take a bit of time. I mean obviously it has to be feasible to run it. 
but generally that can run offline, we let it run. But then when people use the classifier, it needs to be quick. Decision trees are really good for that because it is very simple just to ask a few questions and come up with a result. Okay, so this is what the algorithm looks like. This is the ID3 algorithm. It's a few decades old now, but um, still a valuable uh, algorithm to, to know and understand and be able to, to use. So the idea is that we start at the root and work towards the leaves. So we're building the tree from the top down, even though trees, of course, go this way in real life. But in computer science, I'm sure you're quite familiar with the idea that the root's at the top of the page <laughs> and the branches go downwards. Um, if you get worried by that, just turn your screen upside down. Um, okay, so this is what the algorithm looks like. It's a greedy algorithm, so that already tells you it's not going to be optimal. Um, but basically, it's a recursive algorithm that has two stopping conditions. Uh, one is the ideal one, the stopping condition you like to see. Uh, if all the points in the training set have the same class, then you just return a leaf with that class label. All right, so if we had to classify into two classes, yes and no, do I attend lectures or not, then every single data point was yes, everyone always attends lectures, then that would be our, our tree would be very simple. It would look like this. No need to ask any questions. We would have a single leaf. The root would be the leaf that says yes. Because you wouldn't need to split the data set at all. Right? So that is the trivial case. Now that, of course, usually doesn't happen first. That usually happens after you've done a number of splits. So when you've got a tree with question one, which has some answers, and then question two, and then eventually you get down to a subset down here where all the examples belong to the yes class. At that point, right, we just return a leaf that says yes. And that will be attached to the tree. Right, so that's the one stopping condition. The second stopping condition for the recursion is if there's no more questions to ask. So if you've already tested every single attribute, then you have no, no way of splitting a set of training examples into two subsets or to n subsets. You don't have any more features or attributes. So sometimes your data is not sufficiently expressive to capture all of the relationships between the variables, the relationships between the features and the, the class label. Um, in which case, the best you can do is just take the majority. Right? If you've got five training examples and three of them say yes and two say no, the best, is when you, the best guess is, given a new example, is to say yes, because that's the majority. Right? You know it's only going to be right 60% of the time, based on the data you have, assuming that it's representative. Right? But that's the best you can do. So that's the rule here, that if there's no questions left, you return a leaf, which takes the class label, which occurs most frequently in the examples that you have in the training set. But here the training set is, is the subset you've reached at that point in the tree. Because if you remember, every question is splitting the training set into subsets. Right? It's a petition. We've got three subsets here, and then for each of those, we've split them into two here, let's say. Right? So when we get down to this subset, we're talking about if there are no more questions here, we would take the majority of the training examples which have this answer to question one and this answer to question two. Right? So the, the subset the training set. Right, so that's what's being passed in at each level of the recursion. You pass a subset of the training set. And then the recursive case. This is the hard one to understand. Um, it's one, well, the first thing's quite simple in a sense, right? You just say, find the best question, right, without saying how we do that. Right, so that's to be discussed as how that's done. But having found the best question, so you decide which question you're going to ask. So you decide, I'm going to split the training set into subsets based on this question. And each question has a set of possible answers. Right? It may be two answers, or it may be more. 
right? So there are certain um, variables which have two possible values. Now, if you have a continuous variable, you can't just say what is the value and split it into an infinite number of classes, one for every possible value. It doesn't make any sense, right? So what you need to do for continuous variables is say, is the value less than 31? Or is it greater than 5.3? Right, so you have to choose some value, and we'll talk about how to do that later. You choose some value, and you split into two classes, those for which the value is greater than or less than or whatever particular threshold, and those for which it's not. So for each question, you have a, a finite number of answers, and you know how many there are. So what happens is, let's say it's n is the number, that using this question that we've decided from this find best question method, which we will cover later, now, using that question, we can split the training set into n subsets, and those will be the children, and we just build a tree which has as its root the question, and as its branches, the subtrees, which are generated by calling ID3 on each of these subsets. So we have n subsets. Okay, so you think about what that's saying. It's saying what I've already drawn here. All right, let's just get rid of that for a second. But if we decide a particular question, let's say our question is, you know, is x bigger? Is x less than 3? Well, there's only two possible answers to that. Right, there's a yes branch and there's a no branch. And this will... So this divides the training set into two subsets. Set 1, set 2. Set 1 are the examples where x has a value less than 3. Set 2 is the subset where x has a value greater than or equal to 3. Right, and for each, so that's what we've, we've split the set of training examples into those two subsets, set one and set two, and we build a tree that has question, has a question up here, and it has the two children. Right, and this tr this here will itself be a tree. Let's just draw it like this, right? It'll be trees, and this is the tree which is returned by calling ID three on the subset. Set one, right? and this is the tree which is returned by calling ID three on on set two. Right, so it returns each of those return a tree, and you build a tree which is has this question as a root, and as its branches or its branches of children are uh, subtrees generated by recursive call to to ID three. Right, and it keeps doing that. Recursively, so choose the best question for each of the subsets, returns a subtree, and so on, until what it's returning are leaves because the subset is so small that it's only got examples of the same class. Okay, so that's what the algorithm does. Any questions on how that works? So of course, the, what we didn't cover, right, that these steps are covered, is how they work. They're reasonably straightforward. It requires a bit of thinking as to how you do that in a computer program. But this one we haven't covered at all. How do we do the best question? Um, and in ID3, the restriction is you only ask one question at a time, um, which simplifies things. If you think about it in terms of our multi-dimensional space, our geometrical representation, then if we have x and y, let's just say we've got two variables, and we're only allowed to ask questions like this, this three, right? and what we're doing is we're drawing a boundary here at some value of x. Right? Now we could also ask a question Is y greater than 2? And that would be drawing a boundary here. But these boundaries are perpendicular to each other. They're also perpendicular to the axes. Right? And in a multi dimensional space, it's going to be the same thing. These things will be planes or hyperplanes. 
dividing the space into two, right, based on is x less than three or is it greater than three. Okay, so that's what we mean to say by saying that all of the borders are orthogonal to, to one axis, right? The axis is the, the feature that you're choosing to ask the question about. This works well for symbolic attributes because you can enumerate them. So if you are asking a question, what's the outlook? And there's three possible values, sunny, rainy, or windy. No, no was it sunny, rainy, or overcast? Sorry, windy was a separate question. But you have three different possible values. But that works very well because you just have a tree that has three branches right, for um, Symbolic attributes such as that, you can't really combine them. There's no way of adding overcast to the amount of humidity to the temperature, right? Because you can't combine symbolic and, well, you can't combine them in any way, apart from logically. And the logical combination is done by a sequence of questions. Because to get to a point in the tree, right, this is x has to have a particular value, and then whatever feature you're testing here has to have a particular value, and whatever feature you're testing here has to have a particular value. So you're getting a conjunction here of, of questions, right, or particular answers to questions as you go down the tree. So the logical combination comes as a result of the, the steps through the tree, the path through the tree that the examples take. Um, now, what we're talking about here is how do you know which question is the best one to ask? And the, the idea is we want to choose the question which makes the subsets as well classified as possible. That is, ideally, we want all the yeses on one side, all the noes on the other side. Right? Just as we had when we had, you know, some points down here and some points up here, right? then we wanted to draw a line between them. And, s and separate the crosses from the zeros or the red from the green in the, in the example in the uh, previous slides. So we want that type of thing. Now, of course, in real life, we never get a bunch of x's over here and a bunch of o's up here. We get some overlap, right? There'll be an x up here and an o down here. But what we want is to get the best separation, to find the line. And of course, there'll be other points spread around everywhere. Right? And then we want to find. In this case, we can only draw lines parallel to an axis or perpendicular to uh, the other axes. Um, we have to choose, um, so we choose to draw a line, but we want to get the best separation of the x's from the o's, right, or the green from the red. And so we use entropy, which I introduced in the previous. Uh, lecture right, as the, the measure of how well classified a set of examples is, right? Because the entropy basically measures how much further information you would need to classify all of the examples in the set. Right? So if the entropy is high, you need lots more information. You need to know a lot more about the examples. If 90% of them are already yeses, then it's reasonably well classified, but the entropy will be lower. And so we're going to choose questions which reduce the entropy as much as possible. That's the concept. That makes sense? Uh, and that entropy thing was that formula with here it is. Sums and logs and things. Some mathematics. But hopefully not too scary. It's simple enough to implement just a couple of lines of code. Um, okay. So we have this formula which says we add up for all of the class labels. So C, capital C is the set of all class labels. Could be just yes and no. It could be uh, rainy, overcast, and sunny. Or it could be you know, any set of, but it's a discrete set of values. Right? And 
then so the small c's are those particular values. So you're summing over all the possible class labels, the probability of that class label multiplied by the log to the base 2 of that probability. And these probabilities, what does it mean to, what's the probability of a training example having a particular label? I mean, they either have it or they don't, right? You either do attend lectures or you don't. But then the probabilities are expressed as the um, probability of x being that particular class, right, given that it's <coughs> in this set S. So if you have a set of 10 examples, and nine of them are yes, and one of them is no, then the chance of picking out a yes, if you just randomly select one of those training examples, is 90%. Right, so it's the, it's the proportion. It's what we use as the probability. Right, so it's very simple. Right, so you've got two examples, and nine belong to one class, one belongs to the other class. The probability of getting the first class is 90%, 0.9. Probably getting the other one is 0.1. Right, and so these numbers come out pretty easily. Right, you just count, you're just counting training examples, counting how many belong to one class, how many belong to another class, for each of the possible classes. And then you're summing up these P log P's. Does that make sense? Yes? Why is it minus? Ah, why is it minus? Um, because the log of a number that's less than 1 is negative. And that gives you then positive numbers. Um, so P's are, all these P's are probabilities. So probabilities, or you know, all their fractions of the, of the data set, the other way to think of it is the, you know, what, what proportion of the examples belong to a particular class. So they're numbers between 0 and 1. Right? And so the, the log of a number that's less than 1 is always negative. And so you'd end up here with a, a negative number if you just add up the... So it just turns it into a positive number. And because we're using logs to the base 2, these numbers actually have some meaning. That They are the number of bits of information per example we need to classify the set. So if we come out with a value of 1 overall for the entropy, then we know that we need one bit of information. If we come up with a value of 2, we need two bits of information, for example, to, to classify the set. So they, they have a, a meaning. Now, you might not think in bits per example, um, but when you see the, when you do some of these examples, you'll see how the numbers work, and you'll see that the entropy is decreasing towards um, towards zero as, as you uh, classify the same. So you're saying basically the, the, the more the, um, the entropy you are, the, the higher the value, the number. Sorry? The, so you said the, high, the more the entropy is, the higher the value. Yeah, 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 that's right. So the entropy, entropy is a positive or a non-negative value, uh, but the formula, because these things generate negative numbers, formula has a negative sign in it to, to cancel it out and to give you the, the positive numbers. Right, but not, entropy's not bounded, it's from zero up. So zero entropy means that you know what the class label is. Right, so that's when you've got all of the examples belong to the same class, and you get zero entropy. If you've got two classes and you know nothing about them, right, they're, to, they're exactly even, you've got five yeses and five noes, then your entropy will be one, because you need one bit per example to, right, you don't have any, but as we saw, you remember we looked at the example of you know, having a biased coin, and tossing a coin, what happens if you, your coin is slightly biased? The entropy actually drops, because you, then you have some added information about which class the thing belongs to. You don't need a whole bit. Now, of course, for a single example, you do need a whole bit, because partial bits don't exist. But, uh, but if you're doing a whole lot of examples, then uh, on average, it's the, the number of bits you, you need. Okay, so this is the principle we're going to use, right? We're looking for questions which will reduce the entropy of our training set. But what we're doing, of course, is we're splitting the training set into subsets, right? But when we ask a question like this, we'll end up with two subsets, and each of these will have a certain amount of entropy. And that's what we're trying to do, is trying to reduce these things so that these have basically low entropy, or ideally zero, and we get to zero as a leaf. We don't need to do any more work. 
can just say we know what the class label is. Okay. So for a partition, when we do this split into two subsets, we get two different values for these, and these are the number of bits per example that you need. And then to combine them to get the total amount, you need to multiply them by the size of the subset. If one subset's a lot bigger than the other subset, then uh, it has a lot more weight here. So if you think about it, if we had um, you know, 100 examples, and we asked a question which separated 99 into one subset and one into the other subset, well, the one in the other subset, of course, only has one class label, so it's perfectly classified, but we haven't really got much closer to classifying the other 99 by taking this one example out. Right, so it doesn't only gives us a very small improvement, even though the entropy of that single example goes down to zero, um, it doesn't help us very much on the whole. What we want is to, to get reasonably similar sized subsets if, I mean, well, of course it depends on how many yeses and no's you have or how many you know, of each class you have. But ideally, you want to get all of the yeses on one side, all of the no's on the other side, and that's you know, as much as possible. So, we say the entropy of the position is the sum of the entropies weighted by their size. Um, and entropy, as I said, when we get down to zero, we know what class the examples belong to, right? because all of the examples must belong to the same class for the entropy to be zero. Right? And we can see that if we, if we actually do the, that formula, because we would end up with the sum of P log P's, over all the classes. Now, if there's only one class, then for that class, P log P will be 1 times log of 1. Anyone good at maths? What's log of 1? Yes. 0. Right? If you don't know, ask your calculator. It will tell you. Log of 1 is 0. Doesn't matter what base you have. And we are using log 2, but doesn't matter. So log of 1 is always 0. So for that class, this will be 0. And for all of the other classes, P will be zero. So it'll be zero times log of zero. Now I mentioned last week, I'll say it, or two weeks ago I should say, I'll say it again today. Um, there's a problem with log of zero. Right? Log of zero is, ask your calculator. Infinity. <laughs> yes, so a mathematician will say minus infinity. Ask your calculator, it'll probably say error. Right? Um, so zero times minus infinity is, of course, <laughs> yes, it's, it's not actually zero. Um, it can be zero, if you're lucky. In this case, it is zero because the limit, as p gets smaller, uh, if you do a limit as, x, as p tends to zero of p log p, is actually zero. So as so p gets smaller quicker. Uh, Aside from knowing that for the programming, yeah. do we need to know that for the test, or just know that it is zero? <laughs> well, when you have to calculate it, you'll have to know that this is p is zero, that this p log p is zero, because you calculate it. Won't but will I need to remember that proof? <laughs> no, 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 the proof, no, no, no. You remember a proof, no. no. You just need to know. Um, so, so when we're summing, we get zero for the when p is one, we get zero when p is zero, and therefore the sum of lots of zeros gives us zero entropy overall. Okay, so... What we're measuring here is what we call information gain. We're measuring how much information do we get about the class label. So it's information about the class label that we get by asking a particular question. So how much does asking whether x is less than 3 or not tell us about whether the answer is yes or no? And we can measure that. We can measure that in bits per example. Right? That's what the entropy gives us. Right? So this information gain is the difference between the total entropies before and after doing this split. So we have a total entropy, we can work out the entropy of the examples that we had up here, so the original training set, this is the root of the tree. And then we split it into two subsets, we work out the entropies of each of these, weighted by the number of examples in each subset, and add those together, and see is this less than this, or how much less, right? And that is the, the difference between the two is the information gain. Right? This should be reducing each time the entropy should be reducing as you go down. Can't actually get bigger. 
can only, only go down, but it could stay the same. Right? You can ask questions that don't add to your, your information. Um, so, so this is also the mutual information and information shared between the, the, um, the feature that you're testing and the training examples, given the fact that you may be in the middle of the tree, not at the top of the tree. Right? So these things are now subsets, they're not necessarily over the, the whole training set. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Information gain is G for gain. So given a set of training examples, S, and the question that you've decided to ask, or that you're considering asking, the information gain is the entropy of the original set S, minus the entropy of each of the subsets SI, so SI are the elements of splitting S by the question, right? So this is our Q, Q is here, and this is S1, this one is here, so this is S2, at least the examples, have to be very careful what, what exactly we mean by these things, but, but our, we, that each, at each point in the tree, we can think of the node as representing or containing the, all of the training examples which belong to that point in the tree. So at the beginning we've got all of the training examples, here we've got two subsets, and as we go down we get, we get more and more subsets which correspond to the examples which have particular answers to particular questions that are asked. Right, so that's what the SIs are. SIs are the subsets you get from splitting the complete training subset by complete training set S by the question Q. And then so the entropy of each of those subsets, and that's multiplied by the number, this is the size, right? The number of elements in the set SI divided by the number of elements in the set S. Right? So if we have ten training examples here, and three of them here, and seven of them here, then this would be three tenths of the entropy of this set plus seven tenths of the entropy of this set will be the entropy after doing this split. Right? We compare that with, or we take that away from the original entropy of the training set here, then hopefully there's a big difference. Right? We're gaining a lot of information. So this was G measures. So, how does that work? How do we use that? Well, we take all the possible questions we could ask, and we calculate this G for each possible Q, and we find the one which gives you the biggest G. Right? We've just got the biggest value of this function, so just try lots of Qs until we get one which has the largest value, and we choose that question, put it at the top of our tree, and then we do our recursive split. So this is our find the best question, calculates this. Now, this is not trivial to do. Um, it's quite a painstaking process, and I'm going to make you do it by hand a few times, right? Because this is how you understand stuff, right? Just by actually doing it. Um, but we will go through uh, examples um, tomorrow. We might start on one today, where we actually do this. We calculate the information gain and look at how you do that for each question. How long would they be in the exam if they are there? Well, they are time consuming. Yes, they are time consuming. Yes, we, these I have asked this in previous exams. Uh, asked people to to actually form the ID three algorithm and go through the step. And how long are they? Well, they're not as long as they, they are in the tutorial. Hopefully, right? They'll be reasonably short. And basically, once you've shown that you can get the root and split it into two subsets, you've shown that you understand it. And so after that, usually it's quite a simple process. Um, Okay, so this is what we have to calculate. Um, and as I said, we're doing this for all possible questions and selecting then the question which has the largest G. Right, and so for symbolic questions, it's easy to understand what a question is because the question is just what's your value and each of the branches correspond to each of the answers. Um, for Numerical attributes, as I've said, we have the problem that you can't have an infinite number of children. It's not going to work. Um, 
So we just choose a single threshold value and ask, is the value less than, you can, you can say greater than, let's just say less than the threshold. And you say, well, but that doesn't really help me. There's an infinite number of possible thresholds I can choose, right? So how do we go about that? And here we realize that there's never going to be a benefit of splitting of if we just drew, like given a, an attribute, this is our x, put on a number line, we put all the examples on a number line for x, and it's never going to be advantageous to put a boundary between two examples of the same class. Why? Because you'll always get a better, one way or the other, you'll get a better result by moving it one to the left or one to the right. Um, so if you think about it, if your boundary is saying the yeses are on the left, or the greens on the left, and the, and the reds on the right, then clearly putting it between two green ones is not going to help, because it's always going to be better to move to the right until you get to a red one. Right? And so the rule that we use is you only put um, decision boundaries or thresholds between examples of different classes. Right? And there are a finite number of those. Now, where you put it between them is arbitrary. But it seems to make sense, like in the SVM type approach. You put your boundaries as far away from the examples as possible. So you're as far away from making a mistake as you can be. So we usually just put them at the midpoint between the values that the training examples have. Right? So for each pair of examples that belong to different classes that are adjacent, when you order them by the feature that we're using, so by our x if you like. Now for each of these pairs where the colour changes, we calculate the midpoint, and that's one threshold value. Threshold 1, threshold 2 between the red and the green, threshold 3 between the green and red. And there are no more thresholds here, because it's never going to be better to, to split a set here than it will be to split the set here. Right? You have to believe me on that. We use all three of those T's or just one of them arbitrary? Well, this is the problem. Information gain criterion holds. Uh, our goal is to ask the question which gives us the highest gain in information. Which one is it? Well, I mean, I'm telling you that this, is, this one is not going to be the highest information gain. Right? Putting it between two examples of the same class never gives you the highest information gain. But I can't tell you which of these three it's going to be without going and calculating Right? So we have to test. Just like we have to test whether we're going to check variable x or variable y and ask a question about those ones, if we're going to check, test variable x, there's actually, in this case, three different questions that we can ask. We can say, is x less than t1? Or we can ask, is x less than t2? Or we can ask, is x less than t3? Right? And they're three separate questions. And you can imagine with a large training set, I mean, lots of these points, that's lots of questions to test. Right? This gets really painful. Right? You get very glad that computers are doing the work and not you. <laughs> when you have numeric attributes. Right? If you get symbolic attributes, it's not too bad because usually, you, well, you don't have to worry about this, you just have to worry about which attribute are we going to use. Okay, so that's how it's done. That you've got these two types of questions. For symbolic, you just say what's the value, and it splits into all the different values. For numeric, you have to choose thresholds between pairs of examples. And we'll see what that looks like um, here. Uh, when we look at our, will we attend lectures or not, decision tree, but now we're going to assume that we don't know what the tree looks like yet. We're going to look at some examples. So we've done a test, we've measured eight students, uh, or the same student in eight different days. And these were the cases. The in the first case, the first day, it was sunny, it was 10, 29 degrees, and it was not windy, and the student attended lectures. The second type day, it was sunny, 27 degrees, but it was windy, and the student did not attend lectures, and so on. Right? We have these eight examples, and we're going to try to learn some pattern. Is there any regularity in the student's behavior or not? Right? And we can do that by building a classifier 
based on these data points. Right? Now, this, of course, is a toy example. Real training sets are thousands or millions of examples. Right? But you, the point is here that we can calculate these things by hand and see how the mechanism works on a small example, where in a large example, you just get lost very quickly. So let's do this. Right? We have three features, the outlook, the temperature, and the, whether it's windy or not. And we have one class. Right? Do we attend lectures or not? Now, for a different problem, we could try to build a classifier that works out whether it's windy or not, given the other three features. Right? Or we could try to work out what the temperature is based on these three features. Right? Machine learning can do anything. Um, but in this case, we're assuming the causality is that the weather affects whether or not people attend lectures, and therefore we're going to try to build a classifier for, for this variable for attending lectures based on those three features. And we start by calculating the entropy of the whole training set. So S is these eight examples. So it's a set of eight examples. Each row in a table is a training example. And those eight examples, how many yeses are there? One, two, three, four. How many noes? One, two, three, four. Right, so our entropy is, what is it? It's the sum of what, the minus sign at the front. Right, it's minus the sum of P log P for each of the classes. Right, so each of the classes C, right, so do it properly, or C. Uh, C is an element of our big C. Big C is the set yes, no. Yes. What's the um, algorithm then? Is it saying minus this times minus that? It's not this minus this. Uh, we are asking the, here. On here, the, uh, here? Okay. Well, it's minus this thing. It was yeah. the 4 eighths of, of whatever log 4 eighths is. And this is minutes. So. But they're times together, wasn't it? No, no, these are added together, right? This is the sum. Right. right. Sum. So, so we're adding or. You know, I mean, we could say so, so minus we, and yeah. then put brackets and put a plus here, right? But we're just saying yeah. minus this, minus this, minus this, minus this for each class. That's right. That's, the, that's what we do. Um, so in this case, because they're both 4 out of 8, right, for the yeses, it's 4 out of 8. So this is the probability of yes times the log of the probability of yes. And this is the probability of no times the log of the probability of no. And 4 eighths times log 4 eighths. Well, log to the base 2 of 4 eighths is a half. 2 to the negative 1 is a half, right? So log to the base 2 of 2 to the negative 1 is negative 1. Negative a half of negative 1 is a half. Negative a half of negative 1 is a half. A half plus a half is 1. Right? I can do that in my head, but. You're not used to logs, use a calculator. It will do it for you. But just check that your number's uh, reasonable. Um, and that's kind of what you expect, right? If you've got exactly 50-50 split, then you need one bit of information, for example, to know whether it's a yes or a no. But if the sets were biased, then you need slightly less than one bit, for example. If you had more than two possible class values, you might need more than one bit to tell you which class something belongs to. Okay? So that's what these numbers are going to represent. So you have some feel for, you know, if you have four classes, you might need two bits, for example, if they're totally evenly split, and so on. Okay, okay so we're out of time. Maybe we stop there and continue tomorrow with the hard work of calculating entities, which are the questions.
so